introduce Dr. Brenda Bonnet, um, who is a vet and epidemiologist, has conducted research in many species on many topics, and is extremely interested in human-animal interactions. Brenda is chief executive of the International Partnership for Dogs, and she has been working on engaging multiple stakeholders in dog health and welfare. And Brenda is going to talk to us today on Don't Know or Don't Care, How Beliefs and Attitudes About Dog Health and Welfare Limit Behaviour Change. So, Brenda, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. I, can't, uh, I don't have enough time to tell you about uh, the International Partnership for Dogs, but you can visit us at dogwellnet.com and find out more about us if you like. And I recognize uh, Professor Peter Sando's contribution to this talk. Uh, you'll see some of his research as we go along. How many of you are aware of health and welfare issues in brachycephalic dogs, dogs with flat faces and smush, okay, everybody, good. So um, what I want to do today is uh, using health and welfare issues in brachys, uh, brachycephalic dogs, highlight the complexity, some of the complexities of the human-dog relationship and uh, demonstrate a need to access some of the resources in fields of change of behavior and complex systems in a very brief way today. Uh, in order to promote change. And both of the plenary speakers have talked about these needs for tools and understanding in disciplines beyond perhaps where many of us come from. So I'll pick on the poor old bulldog again. And uh, in preparing this talk, I just Googled one more time information somebody might find if they're looking to buy a bulldog. And in this site, yourpurebredpuppy.com has honest advice about dogs, it says. And it says if you want a dog, here's all good things about bulldogs. And if those appeal to you, you might want an English bulldog. Staying true to its honest advice theme, it also says you must also want stubbornness, food possession, shedding, snorting, snuffling, weaseling, grunting, loud snoring, slobbering, drooling, uh, gas passing, and be willing to experience a multitude of health problems and spend a lot of money to these uh, trusted veterinarians. Uh, in, if that's not what you want, maybe you shouldn't have a bulldog. And so, of course, there's lots of information like this out there, and yet we know that in the past 10 years, there's a lot more English bulldogs, French bulldogs, pugs out in the world. In the UK, particularly, the numbers are skyrocketing. So in spite of this information being available, why are so many people wanting these dogs? Well, why do people want these dogs. We've talked about trends and social contagion and fashion and we all know the influence of uh, Disney and Pixar and uh, social media. We know the influence of celebrities, uh, influenced people. How have we tried to counteract that? Well, of course, many humane and welfare uh, organizations have produced many campaigns, more information, to those of us in the field, it looks great. What a lot of fabulous information, it's out there. There have been academic studies, even specifically into things like the Paris Hilton syndrome. Uh, my colleague, Peter Sando, Sandra Kaur, and, and Claire Palmer have produced, and there's lots of other books on welfare, on ethics, and why people shouldn't have these sick dogs, and we're up against this. And I would say quite many in the audience would agree when I would say, who wouldn't want one of those? <laughs> and I'm not talking about the dog. <laughs> so it's pretty hard for us to compete in uh, some of these ways. Well, as we look at the research in these, uh, into this area, what are some possible reasons people choose compromised dogs or breeds? Well, we start, they just aren't aware of the potential problems, but many of you in the audience go, well, that's not my fault. We've been doing everything. And maybe it's a marketing strategy, but it does seem there's a lot of information out there. Um, maybe what we're saying, these dogs are sick, is actually promoting people to get them rather than avoiding them. 
Um, it may be that people don't perceive these clinical signs as a problem, and Rowena Packer had some good work that uh, analyzed people with brachycephalic dogs, and they said, oh yes, they snore, they snort, they snuffle, they wheeze, but no, they don't have a breathing problem. And veterinarians have probably been complicit in saying, oh yes, that's normal for this breed. Well, it is certainly common, it is certainly usual for the breed, but it is certainly not normal breathing. But could it also be that this, these characteristics, so there's characteristics other than health and well-being that drive people to choose the pets um, that they have? This is a study that Peter and his various colleagues uh, have done. It's a present, this is an abstract. He presented this at a science meeting this uh, spring. The full paper is under review. They were looking for the motivations of people in choosing the pet that they did, their experience with welfare and health problems, and also whether their experience influenced the likelihood they would get another dog of the same breed. They looked at these four breeds, Chihuahuas, French Bulldogs, Cavalier, King Charles Spaniels, and Cairn Terriers, simple random, or a sam random sample of the Danish dog registry, and they had a response rate of 34%. And I apologize in taking a terrific study and summarizing it in about three minutes. One of the things they said is what they examined people's motivation for when they chose that breed. One of the drivers for the Chihuahuas was, was impulse. They didn't do a lot of study. They didn't learn a lot about the breed. They just said, I want one of those, and they got it. Uh, in the French Bulldogs and the Cavaliers, one of the strongest drivers was personality. We love the personality of these dogs. That's what we're looking for. And it was only amongst the Cairn Terrier buyers that they said health was really a priority for them. They examined the experience with veterinary care, access to veterinary care need for veterinary care and cost, and the three species with the little yellow boxes had significantly higher costs uh, for health care uh, during the time that they owned it. They also did the Lexington pet attachment scale and found that especially for the French Bulldogs and the Chihuahuas, people were extremely attached to these dogs. So I will mention one other conclusion as I move here. The study's conclusion was that motivations for choosing specific breeds was uh, very different across different breeds of dogs. And these are four small, mostly popular uh, breeds of dogs. We would think that motivations would be even wider if we included more breeds especially for prospective owners of Chihuahuas and French Bulldogs. They did not prioritize health or welfare issues when they were acquiring the dog. And the third point is extremely important. Except for the very sickest group of French Bulldogs, people did not say that their experience of illness or health problems in these dogs would stop them from getting the same breed again. And so Peter and his colleagues hypothesized that there's some kind of emotional responses to the phenotypic attributes of extreme breeds that make up for the breed pro problems. So whether it's that behavior or that personality that they love or there's something about the appearance, and there's been lots of uh, research on the appearance of these dogs evoking emotional reactions, it's overriding their concerns about health. So we start to see it's a very complex world out there, human-animal interactions, aspects of the dog, the people, etc. cetera. Uh, complex systems theory can help us map out the details. I have no more time to talk about that other than to tell you Dog Ed uh, has some interesting work by Ian Seath of the Dachshund Breed Council where he's tried to uh, do a map of a complex system for brachycephalic dogs. What I want to do today is talk to you about change theory, um, a topic that uh, I am now a total expert in because I read a couple of papers before <laughs> I did this. But it's the great thing about these kinds of projects is that I've run around for years going, yeah, we have to change people's behavior. But it was coming here that pushed me to look into the academic side of it. And of course, many of us hope that the theory of change is this, um, but perhaps we need to be a bit more uh, um, 
explicit. How many of you are aware of the stages of change model? Quite many. Um, very typical, used in human counseling at an individual level right up to trying to get change at a government uh, higher level. And if we just look at the middle of circle for a moment, the idea is you start with someone who's thinking, contemplating there is a problem, they get ready, they take some action or make changes. If they can maintain it, they get changed behavior. But you also see that relapse is built into the model. So it's almost expected that we're going to go in circles here. But what I want to focus on today is this pre-contemplative not thinking part. And that's where a person has no interest in change because they don't see that there's a, a problem. And if I put this in the context of brachycephalic dogs, we have snoring, fainting, snuffling dogs that people think are normal, okay, or even charming. Um, Advocates want better health and welfare, there's no question. The pre-contemplative group, there's nothing wrong with my dog, there's nothing wrong with this breed, there's nothing wrong with the way we're breeding these dogs. And for advocates we go, how can they feel that way? So what's the resistance? Just ignorance, they haven't seen the evidence. Again, we don't, we can't even comprehend that. Um, one group, CRUFA, C-R-U-F-F-A on Facebook is trying to get uh, advertisers not to use the worst of these breeds because they're very popular. So that's one place where we can go. But what if there's a deep personal involvement that makes appreciating this problem overwhelming? And there's breeders who have been breeding these dogs for 35 years. And now we're saying, you've been creating monsters. Ipso facto, you're a monster. And in fact, they are unbelievably attached to their dogs and they don't realize it. It will change their whole ego perception. It'll change their whole life to stand up and say this is a disaster. We need some kind of compassion that people are coming from that place. And luckily, there's techniques to help us look at that. It can be that people say, this is so complex, where the heck do I start? And it's not different than the 150 kilogram teenager or the alcoholic who individually see their problem as insurmountable. What advocates don't want to do is appreciate there's some people who just say it's not really a problem. We're people, they're animals. If we want to create them, it's okay. And anyway, they're not suffering that badly. You don't have to agree with them. You have to appreciate that they're there. But the most important thing is to understand, and here we have the same wheel, pre-contemplation over here, contemplation in the wheel. On this side, changes in attitude, education, information, advice, once we're into action, encouragement, support, and continuing um, support. The interventions that we need need to be segmented, if you will, to bending, depending where the person or the group is on this wheel so that the best efforts at education, information, and advice will not necessarily move the pre-contemplative person onto the wheel ready to make a change. And I think the farming question was just exactly that. How do we move these people forward? Well, one of the things that I think is so important in this area, we have the most resistant and the most committed, and they're the loudest vo votes on so social media. And there may be a whole mass of people, they're already on the wheel, they get it, there's a problem. Some of them are already doing things. What they need is encouragement and support and continuing support. But we're so focused on the loudspoken pre-contemplative group that if we jump to legislation and punishment, we may or may not affect the pre-contemplatives, but we may totally disenfranchise the ones that are already trying to make a difference. So when veterinarians came out with petitions saying, these brachycephalic dogs are suffering and it's terrible and it's all the fault of the breeders, you're all bad breeders and the KC should fix it, not really helpful when maybe there's some pre-contemplatives, but we don't know the percent of people in each of these camps. So we need to tailor these, our responses to, to these different groups. And sometimes when we're arguing amongst ourselves about what we should do next 
and disagreeing on process. We're actually focusing on different target groups. So I propose something to support the people on the wheel. You propose something to get at the pre-contemplatives. We think we're arguing process. We're actually arguing target group without realizing it. So my t take home message is again, what everybody's already saying, it's the humans behind the problem are the issue. There's tools out there that can help us deconstruct these problems. We need to use empathy. I'm happy to see there's a talk on motivational interviewing because that's one way to get at these pre-contemplatives. Uh, learn from other fields, realize how complex it is and just picking one problem to do something about may not be effective, but it may for some parts. And we realize that people have very deeply seated psychosocial reasons for their behavior. And if we want them to change the behavior, we need some more innovative strategies to do it. Thank you very much.